welcome to today's uh, NLM History Talk, which is being held virtually thanks to the outstanding staff of NIH Video Casting and uh, here at the National Library of Medicine. Well, virtually speaking. Uh, my name is Jeff Resnick. I'm chief of the library's History of Medicine Division, and it's my privilege to welcome all who are watching remotely via our global live stream and all who are following us on Twitter using the hashtag NLM Hist Talk. NLM's history talks are designed to promote awareness and use of NLM and related historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the National Library of Medicine to recognize the diversity of its own collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe as well as the diversity of the individuals who use these collections to advance their research, their teaching, and their own learning. It's my distinct privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ashley Bowen, who is editor of Perspectives on, Perspectives on History, uh, a major publication and an important publication of the American Historical Association, which itself is the largest organization of professional historians in the world, representing more than 12,000 members, and it serves historians who represent every historical period and geographic area in a wide variety of professions. Dr. Bowen in, uh, joined the staff of the American Historical Association earlier this year following her tenure at the Science History Institute in Philadelphia, where she was a Mellon ACLS public fellow and served as the Institute's digital engagement manager. For those who are not familiar with the fellowship program, that is Mellon as in the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and of course, the American Council of Learned, Learned Societies. In her role at the Science History Institute, Dr. Bowen connected the collections-based and outreach areas, developed methods for designing, evaluating, and analyzing digital initiatives, and built on those results to create work plans and workflows that allowed for more efficient coordination and communication across the programmatic areas of the institution. She now brings her important background and historical talent to the American Historical Association, innovating perspectives on history to give it even greater currency to reach a wider and more diverse audience. Dr. Bowen received her PhD in American Studies and Public Humanities from Brown University in 2017. Her research focused on 19th century public health and medicine, the material culture of medicine, and representations of the patient experience. In addition to publishing academic work in outlets as diverse as the Journal of American History and ESQ, a journal of 19th century literature, Dr. Bowen regularly writes for the wider public. Her work has appeared on Book Riot and Atlas Obscura, the NLM's own Circulating Now blog, in which she has an interview, which was published last week, and the Smithsonian National Postal Museum's blog. She also participates in outreach events like Nerd Night, Science on Tap, and Obscura Society of DC. Today, Dr. Bowen joins us to talk about her experiences working with the NLM exhibition program, guest curating its exhibition, Rise, Serve, Lead. America's Women Physicians. It, this was launched uh, last year to a very warm reception by the many libraries and cultural institutions nationwide which host NLM traveling exhibitions. Dr. Bone, welcome. Thank you for your presentation today entitled Rise, Serve, Lead and Publish, including women physicians writings in Rise, Serve, Lead, the NLM exhibition, America's Women Physicians. So I'm gonna turn things over to you. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for turning in. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Jeff Resnick for extending the invitation today, Patty Tui for the opportunity to work on the exhibition that I'll be speaking about, the staff of the exhibition program for their unwavering dedication to this exhibition, and all of the librarians and staff members at the National Library of Medicine who made my time here as a guest curator intellectually stimulating, productive, and, you know, obviously, most importantly, it was just a lot of fun to work on this project. It's wonderful to be back, even if it is over the internet and not in the auditorium there. Um, and I'm excited to have the chance to share the stories of three remarkable women physicians with you, while also discussing some of the why behind my decision to incorporate the writing of women physicians into the exhibition, Rise, Serve, Lead. And I should mention, and I should mention um, here at the outset that this exhibition actually uh, was an update, a, a kind of a reframing and a repurposing of the very large 2003 exhibition that some of you may remember called Changing the Face of Medicine, America's Women Physicians, that was curated by Dr. Ellen S. Moore. 
Much of the biographical information that I'll be sharing with you today comes from the work done by Dr. Moore and her team, and I'm indebted to them for the wonderful resource that they created in that website and exhibition. It made it easy to update and to reframe and to rise, serve, and lead. So Rise, Serve, Lead is a traveling banner exhibition and companion website that launched in March 2019 in time for Women's History Month that features short biographies of over 300 remarkable, powerful women physicians, everyone from Elizabeth Blackwell, the first American woman to earn an MD, to Surgeon General Jocelyn, Jocelyn Elders, the first African American and second woman to lead the United States Public Health Service. In addition to these familiar names, the exhibition featured women whose names we may not be able to rattle off quite so quickly or so easily, but who nevertheless changed the face of medicine by breaking barriers. Many of the women featured were the firsts in their fields or fields um, by serving their communities as public health officials and activists and taking on leadership positions inside and outside of American medicine. They are inspirational and awe-inspiring group. Um, and I should say truly while working on this exhibition, there were definitely times when I kind of thought to myself like, gosh, what have I accomplished with my life? They've done so much. Um, and in the talk today, I hope that you'll spend a few minutes after the talk today, I hope that you'll spend a few minutes exploring the hundreds of biographies that are available on the website. Um, you can see on the slides here, I've put the URL on the slide, but it's also easy to find with a Google search where you just put rise, serve and lead in quotation marks. If you do visit Rise, Serve, Lead online, you will also have the opportunity to browse a digital gallery that features the published work of some of the women featured in the exhibition. Rather than provide more portraits or photographs of the women featured uh, in the show, uh, though that would have been a useful resource, I decided to focus on publications that revealed how women physicians participated in medicine as both women and medical professionals. Rather than highlight scenes from their professional or personal lives, I wanted to foreground their research and the perspectives that each woman brought to her field, written in her own words. Fortunately, between PubMed Central, the free full text archive of medical journal articles hosted by the NLM, the History of Medicine Division's digital collections, and the library's general holdings, it was easy to find and share the writing of many of the women featured in the show. With that context out of the way, let's get to what we're actually here to talk about today. How the professional writing of, of cisgendered women physicians can illuminate their unique position as women, as physicians, and as historical actors. Today, I will offer close readings of different kinds of medical writing produced by three physicians, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, and Dr. Frances Conley. Each represents an important first or firsts in her field, but I want to stress here that focusing on those firsts alone, I think, does a real disservice both to the breadth of their careers and to the rich history of women in medicine. Though these three physicians represent discrete eras and specialties, each woman wrote herself into the history of medicine by invoking both the personal I as well as the detached and personal tone of the scientist. After providing a short biography of each author to orient us to the historical context in which she worked, I will offer a close reading of a selected work or works to demonstrate what these sources can reveal about her relationship to a profession that was, at least for these women, still mostly white and mostly male. I am indebted to two scholars for this approach to women's scientific writing. First, rhetorician Susan Wells, whose work Out of the Dead House, 19th Century Women Physicians and the Writing of Medicine, reinforces the link between language, power, and medicine. Wells explains that a careful study of the rhetoric of science tells us a great deal about how writing uh, about the body is its own kind of social practice and form of knowledge. Women physicians' writing, she emphasizes, can help us historicize and complicate our understandings of women in science, gender, and the production of knowledge. Second, it was Eva Hamungsvetten, a scholar of intellectual property, whose 2015 book, Making Marie Curie, Intellectual Property in the Celebrity in the Age of Information, first drew my attention to how and when women scientists invoke I as opposed to either we or the passive voice of science without a body, without a persona. Each of the women I'll discuss today moved back and forth between the personal subjective I, the impersonal passive voice, and the occasional we to signal their position in overlapping communities of medical professionals, women, and activists. How and when they move between those devices tells us a great deal about both the medical and social worlds in which they operated. 
Examining agency and women's medical writing helps us to think differently about norms in medical writing and the ways that medicine has often co been coded as masculine and quote unquote neutral. Today's talk will just begin to scratch the surface of these issues, but I hope will leave you with a sense of how and why we can read these writings as important pieces of public health literature and as documents that speak to the environments in which women doctors find themselves. We'll begin with Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler. Women have always been healers, and Dr. Crumpler's path into medicine was shaped by her early family life and professional experiences. Born in Delaware in 1831, a quote, kind aunt in Pennsylvania whose usefulness with the sick was continually sought raised her. At the age of 22, she began working as a nurse under different doctors for a period of about eight years. This would have been um, from roughly 1852 to 1860. These doctors, all men, provided her with the required letters of recommendation to enter the New England Female Medical School from which she graduated in 1864. When she earned her MD degree, she became the first African-American woman physician in America. Crumpler practiced in Boston for a short time and then traveled briefly to the British Dominion, though she does not specify exactly where. When she returned to the United States, she practiced in Richmond, Virginia, where she worked as the only African-American female physician associated with the Freedmen's Bureau. There, she labored alongside other black physicians, perhaps needless to say, all men, missionaries and community groups to provide medical care to formerly enslaved people. After a few years in Virginia, she returned to Boston where she had her own medical practice for nearly 15 years. By 1880, she had moved outside of the city and was no longer actively practicing medicine. Crumpler explained her decision to go south after the Civil War by noting that there she had, quote, ample opportunity to become acquainted with the, di the diseases of women and children. Although she spent the bulk of her career working in the greater Boston area, it was in Richmond that she developed her worldview. As historian Jim Downs explains in his book, Sick from Freedom, in the Freedmen's Hospital, Crumpler learned firsthand about the importance of what we might now call the social determinants of health. The conditions in which formerly enslaved people lived, worked, and played, not some supposed inherent physiological difference, shaped their health outcomes. After her return to Boston, Crumpler provided care to anyone in need, quote, regardless of remuneration, and wrote eloquently on the complex decisions that working women made to protect the health of their children and their families. These two areas of focus, the care of women and children and the conditions in which people live and work, shaped her medical career, not just the writing we'll be talking about today. And I should say that the fact that we know about Dr. Crumpler at all is the re direct result of her writing. No photographs, engravings, or other images of her survive. In fact, the existence of her book is how we know that she existed at all and earned her degree before Dr. Rebecca Cole. Crumpler published a book of medical discourses in two parts in 1883, a few years after she stopped actively practicing medicine. The bulk of the biography I just shared with you is derived from the first few pages of her book, where she presents herself to the reader, builds credibility by sharing back her background and training, and explains the origin of the book in her, quote, long-kept journals. Susan Wells points out, however, that given the tone, the organization, and, and length uh, of the book, that these journal entries were almost certainly reworked before being published in what is, you know, actually a relatively standard format for, for the era. Crumpler's book begins with I. It is the first word. She wrote, quote, I now present to the public a few thoughts in book form. Although certain aspects of her identity remain obscured throughout the text, she never directly mentions race, for example. Her authorial voice is personal and present from the beginning. She does not begin by describing the women to whom she addresses the book, describing a particular patient, disease, or social condition, um, though she would go on to do all of those things in the text. Instead, she claims authority in much the same way that a male physician would, who began his book by emphasizing perspective, uh, his pers who would begin his book by uh, emphasizing his perspective in his work. She addresses mothers, nurses, and women generally, rather than men or other physicians, almost of course exclusively men, so by setting her book up in this way, Crumpler created a space in which she could demonstrate her skill as a physician, offer guidance to her readers, and create a medical dialogue organized by a woman and intended to be read by other women. Her goal here is explicit. 
She says early on that my book shall be as a primary reader in the hands of every woman, and that, quote, if women are permitted to read about all branches of medical science and reflect for themselves, it is hardly possible that they will say it is uninteresting to them or that it should be read only by men. Although she makes clear that part of her project is to improve what we might today describe as health literacy, she stops far short of the kind of feminist, woman-centric view of medicine that would emerge in the 1960s with the women's health movement. Throughout the book, Crumpler positions uh, her experienced authoritative eye as a trusted familial guide for her readers. Her tone is simultaneously that of an experienced physician and a caring relative who admonishes the reader with lines like, quote, there is no known law preventing care carefulness. Crumpler claims her expertise in large and small ways throughout the book. When describing how to first wrap an infant after cutting its umbilical cord, she observes that it often happens that the blood oozes from the cut cord, but, quote, seldom does this happen by the new method. I should say, my method. Here, she acknowledges multiple methods and makes a claim on the one that she created, the new method. No longer simply the realm of common sense or wisdom passed down from woman to woman, she seeks a claim on an intervention, asserting innovation and action. Her eye is of a physician, well-versed in the journals and medical documents of her era. Although she takes great care to speak to her audience in simple and familial language, she also emphasizes that she pays attention to larger medical discourses and literature, noting that I do not fail to notice the various published records about conditions in Boston. Crumpler's identity as a physician, trained as such and participating in the world, uh, in that world, permeates the book. Although she's writing for women, Crumpley, uh, and I should say, one of the things that I found very interesting is that although she is writing for women, uh, Crumpler very rarely refers to midwives, um, which I thought was strange. So I went back and I double checked. I did keyword searches. I tried to find it in the text um, and I couldn't. And I cannot help but wonder if this reflects a desire to separate herself as a professional physician, with, as a professional physician um, with academic training from most of the women that would have been practicing the healing arts in that era and to whom her book is addressed. I hope that future research is able to, to look into that more. I thought that was really interesting. When criticizing her male colleagues, as she does occasionally throughout the text, Crumpler leads with a generalized language that does not invoke the eye before driving home her criticism from her position as a doctress. She speaks instead of, quote, women doctors, or more properly speaking, doctresses of medicine, although usually treated with less courtesy by doctors, are, nevertheless, by them considered to be in their proper sphere in the confinement room and nursery. While I feel under no obligations to them for their charity, I must admit their honest truthfulness in this matter. I was struck by this construction because it foregrounds the small number of women physicians before Crumpler's voice steps forward to, um, with a definite edge, embrace the roles that male physicians have allotted to her and her peers. Her professional identity gives her the authority to criticize, even as she stops short of rejecting their position. We makes an appearance somewhat regularly in the book, particularly when Crumpler wants to draw attention, draw the reader into particularly when Crumpler wants to draw the reader into her view on specific health policies. For example, when she discusses efforts to ensure pure, mur pure milk is available for infants, Crumpler notes with approval that, quote, formerly dropsical, emaciated, half-starved, fretful babes were very numerous. But since of late, judicious legislation has been brought to bear on the matter of adulterating milk, things have changed. She goes on to say that, quote, we may hope to hear that infantile deaths from this probable cause decrease annually. It is possible to read this as a royal we, and there are certainly examples of that in the book, but I think it's more useful to understand this we in terms of Crumpler's larger project. She wanted to bring women into medicine, into the active participation in the care of their families. Here, she does that rhetorically by implying that the reader also cares about pure milk and will also want to read about the decrease in infant mortality attributed to this cause. Here, her use of the we is less about claiming a relationship to other physicians and more about claiming a relationship with her reader, the women who she hopes to reach to inspire and act. We in Crumpler's book is only sometimes racialized. Though her health advice is general and certainly applicable to women of all races, Crumpler clearly identified with laboring black women. Although she never directly, directly addresses her race to the extent that she doesn't write about it or reflect on what impact her race may have had on her career, she doesn't deny it either. 
At various points, she identifies explicitly with the laboring, with the quote, laboring women of my race. In this passage, focused on the necessity for black men and women living in poverty to leave the home and do hard manual labor that impacts their health, Crumpler uses an I and an R to position herself within the community of black laborers, while nevertheless maintaining a certain professional distance. The extent to which she creates a rhetorical community in this book, and to be clear, her project again was aimed at encouraging better caregiving habits by women, it is one that explicitly includes Black women, their families, and their homes. Crumpler acknowledged the material reality that many Black women were living in. Um, she included really lovely descriptions of specific consumer goods, home layouts and design, furniture, um, but she didn't attribute that to inherent difference or racial traits. Um, she really saw that as something that was economic. My hope is that future research will be able to investigate the reception of Crumpler's book by Black families. Her form and project were not unique. Um, care and feeding manuals for children were not uncommon in the 19th, in the 19th century, um, but the we that she created, I think, was unique. Let us now turn to Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, a woman who began her career a century after Dr. Crumpler. They worked and wrote in radically different circumstances both in terms of the scientific knowledge they applied to medical care and in terms of their position in American society. But both, um, but both were deeply interested in the social determinants of health. Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias was born in New York in 1929 and spent her early years in Puerto Rico as well as the mainland United States. She attended university in Puerto Rico where she became an outspoken advocate on issues like freedom of speech and Puerto Rican independence. She did not move away from politics and social justice activism as she entered medicine. Instead, she brought a social medicine approach to her pediatric and public health practice, working to address, um, to address systematic issues that impacted her patient's health, including racism, gender discrimination, and poverty, as well as practicing the best evidence-based medicine, defined her career. In, in the 1970s, not long after returning to the, to the mainland United States from Puerto Rico to practice medicine at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx, Dr. Rodriguez Trias attended a conference on abortion at Barnard College. From then on, she became an active member of the women's health movement and a proponent for reproductive rights. Dr. Rodriguez Trias was committed to a vision for reproductive rights that resembles today's movement towards reproductive justice. Her personal and family history shaped this commitment. She explained that, quote, the experiences of my own mother, my aunts and sisters who faced so many restraints on their struggle to flower and reach their potential, shaped her work on the issue of women's rights and bodily autonomy. She was committed to a woman's right to choose abortion and a strong defender of a woman's right to parent if and when she wanted to. She worked to limit the forced sterilization of poor women, women of color, and women with disabilities. In the 1980s, Dr. Rodriguez Trias advocated for improved care for women during the HIV epidemic as the medical director of the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute. Her advocacy and medical work took her around the world. She was deeply attuned to local and national activists' work on behalf work and wrote often about the impact that these groups had, their collaborative projects with doctors and hospitals, um, and what medicine might be able to learn from these organizations. After serving as a co-founder of both the Women's and the Hispanic Caucuses of the American Public Health Association, she served as the first Latinx president of, uh, excuse me, she served as the first Latina woman to lead the American Public Health Association in 1993. Before she died in 2001, President Bill Clinton awarded her the Citizen Service Medal for her work on behalf of women, children, people with HIV AIDS, and poor people. A century after Dr. Crumpler wrote herself into the historical record, Dr. Rodriguez Trias used medical publishing to advance equity, justice, and medical knowledge inside the field. Unlike Dr. Crumpler, who was the sole author of a single book published later in her career, Dr. Rodriguez Trias's corpus of writings appeared in various medical journals, public health journals as well, throughout her decades of practice, and she regularly shared authorship with her colleagues in both medicine and public health. Much of her writing for the American Journal of Public Health and Public Health Reports are calls to action, as well as clear scientific reports on public health surveillance data. 
I'm going to spend the least amount of time today uh, on Dr. Rodriguez Trias's writing, not because it isn't important. She was, without question, a powerful writer who published pointed critiques of the American medical system, but because, in many respects, the bulk of her writing is in a style and a genre which many of us are familiar public health studies and reports, columns as APHA president, and activist pleas in journals. She, like many physicians, also gave presentations at medical conferences. I'm going to look specifically at two of her public presentations that were later presented in medical, reprinted in medical journals. First, the hospital is a community facility, the medical staff in the hospital, a 1972 presentation to the New York Academy of Medicine that was republished in the Bulletin of the New York Academy of Medicine. And second, her 1993 APHA presidential address, titled Women Are Organizing, Environmental and Population Policies Will Never Be the Same, reprinted in the American Journal of Public Health. These speeches, printed for broader readership of, of her medical peers, showcase a woman physician who used her status in the field to push for serious reform. In 1972, a decade into her career in medicine and public health, Rodriguez Trias addressed the conference of the New York Acad Academy of Medicine. In the presentation, presented as part of a panel, she offered a concise description of the difficult circumstances facing Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx and noted that, quote, the health problems of the 500,000 predominantly Puerto Rican and Black people who live there cannot be separated from their economic and political oppression in United States society. As a physician on staff at Lincoln Hospital, she couches her powerful critique in data and statistics and does not foreground her, her own experience, uh, excuse me, she couches her powerful critique in data and statistics and does not foreground her own experiences and these pointed observations of larger power structures that influence health. When she does invoke the I, only a handful of times throughout the presentation, it is to explain how these power structures have influenced the practice of medicine inside the hospital. Describing the impact of a new program, she says, quote, I can speak with some firsthand knowledge about the effects on pediatrics. Here, the eye she invokes is that of a staff physician, and later, when she talks about, quote, those of us who participated, she means other physicians. The we and are in this speech uh, is clearly the medical staff of Lincoln Hospital, unsurprising, of course, given the audience the presentation was for, um, you know, other physicians at a medical conference. Her identity as a woman or a Puerto Rican was irrelevant in this context. Although Rodriguez Trios was deeply attuned to the social and economic environment in which her patients lived, as well as the racial animosity that they faced, these are not in evidence in this speech. An activist in her life and career, and while working at a hospital that was the site of important medical activism in the 1970s, Rodriguez Trias retains the eye of a doctor throughout. She positions herself not as an activist or Latina, but as, a, as part of a medical establishment and a participant in the hospital's response to health disparities and financial pressures. In this article, Rodriguez Trias also invokes a them. While describing the hospital's work with a group of nine young adults interested in healthcare and doing more than merely screening for lead poisoning, these activists, quote, want to help organize people in terms of solving their health problems. Although she's clearly sympathetic to the fact that the group has an orientation of its own, she does not go so far as to position herself within that group or the group of people who face these kinds of health problems. In fact, she makes explicit that race and class are barriers for members of the medical staff and that the slow, gradual change required to accomplish major activist wins is sometimes incompatible with the medical establishment, noting that we, meaning medical professionals, are thus learning that changes are accompanied, not, are accompanied, are accompanied only by dedication to daily struggles over long periods. Unlike Crumpler, who a century earlier positioned herself willingly, willingly or not, as part of the community of Black laboring women that she wrote about, Rodriguez Trias retains the professional distance required of mid 20th century medicine. 25 years later, while serving as the president of the American Public Health Association, Dr. Rodriguez Trias gave a presidential address on the work that women's grassroots organizations did to address issues related to family planning, population, and the environment. In many respects, this address draws on themes already in evidence in her 1972 presentation that defined her career. She is deeply concerned with the power dynamics that make certain people, especially women and people of color, vulnerable to poor health outcomes. In this address, given at the pinnacle of her career, she is much more explicit about her eye. She says, my views are 
before explaining that she thinks that, quote, women's participation and full partnership and discussions are crucial to crafting policies and programs that will work. As she did before, the I she invokes here is a seasoned public health professional and member of the medical profession. When she uses the I, it is to advance her opinion based on that identity. The we in evidence in this article remains almost exclusively the we of public health workers and physicians. Again, though, this should not be surprising given the forum in which this lecture was delivered, its audience, and the degree to which any president of the APHA would speak to their members as anything but a representative of that group. Although she speaks powerfully and movingly about the need for physicians to work closely with community members, she couches that language as though these two groups are distinct, saying, quote, we need to learn from women, not just from the content of what they want, but from their, from their processes, how they organize themselves and how they transcend historical rifts that have impeded cooper internal, international cooperation. She does not position medicine or public health uh, she does not position medicine or public health yet as part of these activist circles, um, even if individual physicians and public health workers, including herself, have been doing that kind of work for years. The we here re remains institutional and distinct. I will close today with another woman physician who improved the lives of women. Unlike Dr. Rodriguez Trias, who advocated for policy changes on behalf of women worldwide, and Dr. Crumpler, who instructed women on how to better care for their families and interact with physicians, Dr. Frances Conley forced a reckoning inside the medical profession. In 1991, Dr. Conley resigned her tenured faculty position at Stanford University's medical school, uh, at Stanford University's medical school, because of sexual harassment and discrimination. She also took her fight public, writing about the treatment of women doctors, residents, nurses, and support staff in op-eds and in a memoir that reached far, a far broader audience than her resignation letter ever would. Within a year of her resignation, Stanford had adopted policies to protect people from harassment and took at least limited disciplinary action against a few male physicians whose behavior was particularly egregious. She returned to Stanford and continued to practice medicine, conduct research, and speak about the culture of gender-based harassment in medical education. Born into a Stanford family, her father um, was himself a university professor. Uh, Conley early on decided that she wanted to be a doctor, not just a missus. Her life included many firsts, among them becoming the first woman to start a rotating surgical internship at Stanford University the first woman to be a tenured professor of neurosurgery in the United States. And as a runner myself, I'm particularly impressed that she was the first woman to finish the San Francisco Beta Breakers 7.8 mile race. She held dual appointments at Stanford University Hospital and at the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Palo Alto, conducted groundbreaking research and served on various academic committees and councils at Stanford. Her decision to leave the university came after her dean decided to appoint someone chair of her department, who she described as having, and I quote, an overt contempt for women. His appointment came after decades of suffering small and not so small indignities at the hands of her male colleagues. To her, this dean's decision was, quote, a direct hard slap to my face and confirmed in a manner vivid enough for all to see my second class status, my second class citizenship within our work environment. Rather than continue to accept the status quo in which male surgeons got away with treating female co coworkers like sex objects or servants, she spoke out, and not just in her university, but in public. Her resignation became front page news in the San Francisco Chronicle. She was, I have to say, in some respects, an unlikely candidate to lead the charge against a culture of sexism and sexual harassment because she understood that proximity to power was itself useful. She had at one point seen putting up with these behaviors as the price of admission to this rarefied club. Although she found the behavior of her male colleagues upsetting, Conley also said that, quote, I realized this medical world was as it was, and I could take it or leave it. If certain actions were disrespectful to women, so be it. Had I voiced any objection, I would have derailed my career in surgery. Nevertheless, the culture at Stanford and many other medical schools around the nation simply became untenable. When she left, she did not go quietly, but used her relative privilege as a tenured professor, doctor, and white woman to improve conditions for all medical students. Though she did not start the fight, she did accept it and laid the foundation for today's medical students advocating against hostile, hostile work environments and gender-based discrimination. 
Before I talk about Conley's memoir, I want to emphasize that like Crumpler and Rodriguez Trias, Dr. Conley contributed a number of scientific papers to medical journals and textbooks. As primary and secondary author, she wrote papers available on PMC about toxoplasmosis, lumbar disc disease, tumor growth, and a lot more. These scientific contributions are many and valuable, and someone trained as a research scientist would do them far more justice than I can. She turned to the issue of sexism in American medicine only in the mid-1990s, a few years after earning tenure, and well into her own, her own top thinking on the topic changing. She contributed a number of pieces on sexual harassment and sexism to professional outlets like the New England Journal of Medicine and the journal Radiology. Importantly, though, she did not write exclusively for her medical colleagues. She contributed op-ed pieces to newspapers and published a memoir um, de detailing her fight with Stanford and the evolution of her own thinking, from being, quote, one of the boys proximate to power but never protected by the same structures that protected white male surgeons, to resigning and making public the culture of harassment and discrimination that permeated Stanford. Walking Out on the Boys, a memoir of Conley's medical education and years fighting against sexism in American medicine, came out in 1998 with the trade publisher Farrar, Strauss, and Garreau. Of the writing I've discussed today, this one has perhaps the most personal and the most public eye and use. She writes about deeply personal, even traumatic events, and does, does so not only for the consumption of her peers, but by the general interested public. Unlike other pieces I've discussed, this book got a New York Times review upon its publication. She emphasizes her credentials and the scientific work she produced, but never strays far from the personal experience of practicing medicine in a female body in the mid 20th century and late 20th century. The book begins with her childhood and education, including detailed and difficult to read descriptions of how women medical students were treated by their peers and instructors. She describes how when she began her neurosurgeon surgery residence in 1966, she was met with what she described as quote marked alarm by her male colleagues. I will not quote from these passages because they are disturbing. They include everything from inappropriate jokes, and I say jokes in quotation marks, um, to the display of pornographic images, groping, and even assault. If you are curious about the hostile environment that women physicians worked in during the middle and late part of the 20th century, it is an eye-opening and distressing account. These stories have an intense emotional impact and set the stage for what makes up the bulk of the book, her decision, uh, the events that culminated in her decision to resign from Stanford and to do so in the public eye. As a memoir, the eye is, unsurprisingly, central to walking out in the boys. Conley does not hide behind the impersonal passive voice of often employed by science. Instead, this book is undeniably about her experience. Conley certainly presented herself in the best possible light. She leads with her extensive and impressive background, her training, professional and, per, uh, and personal accomplishments. She foregrounds her happy, if not always easy marriage and focused on how her various and unique experiences led her to take this drastic step. These personal stories and their eye increase the emotional impact of the abuse in ways that statistics alone simply would not communicate. Conley rarely employs the we, speaking as, you know, this is a memoir, she's talking about herself, um, even though she acknowledges that her struggle was part of a larger movement to address sexual harassment in medicine. I was particularly moved by a passage towards the end of her memoir in which she explains that although she gets much of the credit for leading the charge at Stanford, the heroine of the Conley story is, quote, not only Conley. There were approximately 20 heroines, 20 angels of mercy, mostly nurses, along with some clerical staff who were willing to break a covenant of silence and tell the truth about unacceptable flirtatious behavior. Here, she rejects the I that so characterized the rest of the book, but doesn't quite join the we composed of women across the medical profession. It is a strong closing, one that positions uh, her work is part of a much larger, longer, and ongoing project to make academic medicine more, willing, more welcoming to women. At the same time, she doesn't quite position herself as in solidarity with women across the medical field or working world in general. And in fact, throughout the book, she's hesitant to, hesitant to align herself with those activist women. I will admit that when I picked up Walking Out on the Boys, I worried that it would feel dated or that she would fail to acknowledge the privilege of its author 
of herself as its author, a white cis academic with tenure at one of the world's leading research universities. Instead of a time capsule, I found a book that sadly could have been written today. For example, Conley is attuned to how Latina women working in support positions were doubly inferior in the eyes of the white male physicians who victimized them. She's attuned to the ways that their racial and gender identities made them more vulnerable to victimization in the first place and to retribution if and when they filed complaint, complaints. Perhaps the greatest contribution of walking out on the boys is not that it provides closure or an end point, but that Dr. Conley's testimony reminds us that everything has a history. In light of the Me Too movement, more women in medicine are speaking up about conditions in hospitals for doctors, nurses, and support staff. Two years ago, NBC News completed a month-long investigation and found, quote, widespread sexual misconduct in hospitals and other healthcare settings. Conley's book may still prove useful to, this genera to a new generation of medical students working to reject the culture of medicine as it is. Her I may be useful in creating a we, after all. In 2019, for the first time, women outnumbered men in medical school according to data collected by the Association of American Medical Colleges. As more and more women join the ranks of academic medicine, I'm hopeful that we will no longer require publication as proof of their existence as we did in Dr. Crumpler's case, or focus on their writing only when they are re protesting injustice or demanded to be, demanding to be treated with dignity and respect, as was the case in Dr. Conley's case. When women physicians choose to speak as an I, a we, or an unembodied passive voice of science reveals more than a stylistic choice. Rather, it speaks to the environment in which women work and the kinds of authority that they claim at any given moment. As more women begin to rise in the ranks, as, in the ranks of medicine, serve their communities, and lead movements for change, we should attend to how they position, how they position their writing in those struggles. I'm grateful to the National Library of Medicine and other medical libraries around the country for collecting these physicians' work and making it available to researchers as they investigate how women have participated in medicine over time, in addition to the individual scientific findings that they generate. Thank you again for attending today's lecture. I hope I've whetted your appetite for the exhibition and that you'll spend some time reviewing the biographies and publications on Rise, Serve, Lead. I think we have some time for questions, so I'm happy to turn this over to Q&A at this point. Thank you again for coming. I really appreciate it. And sorry oh. about my screen. I know that this light got a bit strange there for a minute. Not at all. Uh, it, everything went, went swimmingly. Uh, this was an outstanding and very important presentation, as we all know, and uh, very grateful to host you and to learn about your work and the stories of these remarkable women and the currency of this exhibition and indeed your, your research today. Uh, very important and very helpful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have about 20 minutes for, for questions and I have two uh, that have come in. And uh, the first is, uh, is this, by focusing your research on the scientific writings of these women, were you necessarily omitting the work of women who served and led as hands-on medical practitioners without publishing? Are there unpublished journals, hospital records, or other sources that could augment the published writings of groundbreaking women physicians? Yeah, I mean, the short answer to that question is yes. Um, and I would love to be able to get my hands on all sorts of those things. Um, the reason that I chose to focus on the published, there are a couple of reasons I chose to focus on the published writing. Um, the first one is, you know, the obvious one, which is that it's easier to get your hands on this stuff because it's available through PMC, it's available in the library's collections. Um, but also because publication and participating in peer-reviewed medical journals or publishing a monograph is something that is how physicians talk to themselves, right? Like it's a, it's still a publishing field, even as there are also these informal ways that physicians and nurses and su medical support staff speak to each other. So I wanted to look at how women were participating in that kind of highest level of medical discourse. Um, but it would also be fascinating to get my hands on, for example, Dr. Conley's personal correspondence to her, her friends that she was writing to during this time period, or to get a sense of what kinds of communication she was having with some of the nurses that she talked to. So in, the, in her memoir, she talks about how 
once it became clear that she was going to go down this path and really push Stanford to take action, she ended up speaking informally to women who are working as nurses, who were working as clinic support staff, who also had these experiences with male physicians. Um, and she recounts some of that in the book, but it would be really fascinating to see if there's other kinds of documentation there. Um, and then to, to the other part of the question, um, some of it is that finding those archives can be really difficult, um, either because, you know, they might be protected out of privacy concerns, those medical records aren't always open for research to the public, um, or they end up in various collections around the country, so it requires um, more travel for research, more you know, awareness of where different archives are and what they hold. Um, but I think it would be really fascinating, certainly, to augment these, poli you know, these are all very polished, public, carefully crafted um, writings, and to augment that with what are some things that people aren't spending maybe as much time on, but are a much more, like, functional, I have to communicate something to another physician, I have to communicate something to another nurse um, kind of writing. So I hope that answers the question. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, another question we have uh, begins with uh, excellent talk. Uh, to what extent, uh, this individual writes in, uh, did each woman represent the demands of her generation and time? And how were those demands different? That's a great question. Um, and I think, I mean, I could give a whole talk on each one of these women trying to answer that question about each of them. Um, what I will say, you know, I picked these three for a reason, um, because I think that they did they encapsulated different eras, I think, very nicely. Um, and so, you know, I think you've picked up on, I, I don't want to say that they are like the crystallization or the distillation of what it meant to be a woman in medicine in the 1990s or the 1880s, because I think, I think that flattens important distinctions. I mean, Rebecca Crumpler, uh, working as an African-American woman physician in the late 19th century is gonna have a very different experience by nature than even white women working as physicians then, certainly as other midwives, as other medical professionals at that period. But I do think that they encapsulate, you know, I think some of what they encapsulate is this trend from the kind of writing a medical manual that was intended for a general public um, that couches their medical observations in a sort of familial personal experience to Helen Rodriguez Trias really emphasizing her position as a leading public health professional who is speaking to other public health professionals, even though she's doing it for activist reasons. Um, she's retaining that voice to Dr. Conley, who has that voice and chooses to write in a much more personal and engaged way, because that's, that's you know, at the late 20th century, that's the way to make that change. Um, I think is some of what I was trying to get at, that there is this kind of evolution over time. At the same time, I'm really attuned to the fact that actually, you know, when, when Dr. Conley was having her confrontation with Stanford, I mean, that was when Helen Rodriguez Trias was the president of the APHA. And so they're operating, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing medicine to be better, they're pushing public health to be better, um, and they're doing it strategically in very different ways. And I think that, you know, if I'd had more time or if I were to develop this into something else, I might think about what are the strategic reasons that people employ these different tactics at different times. Um, so it, that's kind of a yes and a no. I think that they are certainly representative of their generations, but I don't want to suggest that they, that that means that, that they are the only iteration of what happened in their generations. Certainly. Thank you. And in fact, this next question uh, piggybacks on the previous one and your, your answer. And the question is, while uh, pertains to Dr. Rodriguez Trias. So while Dr. Rodriguez Trias positioned herself at a professional distance from the underprivileged groups uh, for whom she was advocating in her published medical articles, did she ever openly share her own challenges and experiences as a member of those groups to strengthen her arguments on the basis of her background and her accomplishments? Yeah, so this is this is the really interesting question, and it's one of the things that I'm particularly fascinated by is how and when um, people with a lot of status, meaning a lot of education or a lot of professional accomplishments, deploy these kinds of personal stories and their personal experiences that might butt up against some of those things. So there's that quote that I shared uh, in here where she does talk about how some of her commitment to reproductive justice 
you know, she credit she goes to that conference at Barnard and she and and it's fantastic and she becomes a committed member of the women's health movement. But she does talk about how some of that commitment is a product of watching what her mother went through, what her siblings went through as women, and what they needed to do to flourish. Um, and she also talked about being a divorced woman at a period where that was not as common. Um, so she does share some of that. It's not that she and and I want to be clear that I don't blame her. I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily that she doesn't you know, lead with her own identity. I think I think it was completely and totally appropriate and understandable for her as president of APHA to speak as a public health professional, as a physician to other public health professionals. Um, but it, it is that question of like, what register does she speak in and at different moments? And I think, again, that's that's some of what what people are asked to do when they have multiple identities that they're bringing into a space like that. Um, and so, you know, it's, true that she doesn't, she never hides that identity. She never denies it. Um, but it isn't necessarily what she's foregrounding when she's at a medical conference or when she's leading the American Public Health Association. Whereas, um, and I think Dr. Crumpler is, is similarly that way, right? Where she never talks about her race directly. She never says, and as an African-American woman, my career has been shaped by that or, you know, or whatever. Um, but she does then in these sort of subtle ways, say the laboring women of our race, she identifies with, um, with black women as opposed to the male physician she's talking about. So there are these places where people, um, where where these women kind of shift back and forth between them. Um, and then of course, Dr. Conley's book is very explicitly that, where she very explicitly leads with, because I was a woman, my experience in medicine was different. And because I was a woman, um, my experience as a neurosurgeon was fundamentally unlike the experience of my peers. Thank you. So um, a, a related question. Uh, there is some historical precedent, this individual writes, for women in science to publish under pseudonyms or just using their initials to hide the fact that they were women. Have you encountered women who took this approach in your research? Do you see them as helping in the cause of equality championed by the women you discussed or did their anonymity serve to reinforce the male dominated environment? Well, this is a good question. Um, is a good question. I I am not going to pass judgment on how and when other people decided to publish and under what name they published. Um, I think that those are intensely personal decisions that people make for all kinds of reasons. And who am I to second guess them? Um, but you're right. There is a precedent for people, you know, publishing under A. Bowen or A.E. Bowen or something like that. Um, you know, I, I was very focused on these women, I think in part because they didn't take that path. And I think, you know, for, for Dr. Crumpler in particular, it could have been, it might have been advantageous for her not to publish uh, with a woman's name. I, I don't, I mean, that's a counterfactual, I don't know, but I could imagine that there might have been some consideration for that, which I think makes it all the more powerful that that wasn't the decision that she made. Um, you know, to the, you know, like I said, to the, the extent to which I think that's a good or bad thing, it's not really for me to say. I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm hopeful that in the future, people won't have to make those kinds of decisions that that, you know, assumptions about identity will not matter as much. Um, but that is forward looking rather than retrospective. Understood. So uh, given that you, uh, this is a, a project that you have completed, uh, and you have multiple other projects that you're working on, as well as very important work you're doing at the American Historical Association. If you had uh, a defined period of time to dedicate to a next chapter in this work, a next chapter in this curation, where would you go with that? What would you feel to be the most important dimension to explore further, given everything that you've shared with us today? Oh, I should have anticipated this question and I didn't. Um, I think that I would really like to know a little bit more about the reception of these works, um, particularly Dr. Crumpler and Dr. Conley's. You know, I like I said, it's I I sort of did a disservice to Dr. Rodriguez Trias because I kind of use her as the counterexample. Like she wrote, I, I talk about you know conference presentations at medical conferences, public health journals, and professional reports, that kind of stuff with her. Um, so I would like to know a little bit more about the reception of medical writing by women that on one hand was intended very explicitly to draw other women into um, not necessarily the practice of medicine, but certainly she talks a lot about like, you'll be better able to talk to your doctor. You know, you can kind of question what your doctor is telling you. You can know when to call your physician. 
Um, and if her identity as a black woman changed that reception, if it shaped anything about that, um, I this is sort of a fantasy because I don't exactly know how I would go about doing that. But you didn't ask me if I knew how I would do it. You just asked me what I would like to know. What I would like to know. Um, and similarly with Dr. Conley, I mean, you know, her book gets written up in the New York Times. Her resignation is the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, it's happening in the early, you know, her book comes out in the late 90s, 98. Um, but the events that took place were in the early 90s, and then there's some time that passes. And so that was also a moment when there was a lot of conversation about sexual harassment, um, where there was a lot of com conversation around feminism and power dynamics in the workplace and that kind of thing. And I would love to know a little bit more, too, about how it, that era um, kind of airing academic medicine's dirty laundry was received not just by her medical peers, but more broadly by a feminist movement that was in transition, let's say, at that time. Um, so I think for both of them, I would like to know more, not, not necessarily about the production of the work, but about its reception and its its circulation um, among, among women. Very good. So uh, we've received several other uh, emails um, about your talk, all of which say fantastic talk in a variety of ways. And I would like to reiterate that, uh, as would many, uh, uh, of course, everyone who's tuned in today. Um, and I want to thank you very, very much for your work with the National Library of Medicine with regard to this uh, very important exhibition and preparing this, this presentation today as part of our series. Uh, I would also like to share with you and, and all of our viewers that the archived live stream of this presentation will be available uh, through the NIH video casting system. Uh, I will tweet out the link when it is available and I will certainly send it to you so you have it for your, uh, your information to share with your colleagues and your network. So uh, Dr. Bowen, thank you very much for your time this afternoon and for this very important work that you shared with us. Thank you, it was lots of fun. I had a, it was fun to work on this. Thank you. Have a great holiday season, and thanks to everyone for tuning in this afternoon.